point is that with this sort of me, me, me attitude, we tend to get quite obsessed about me and my happiness and me and my suffering. And when we become obsessed about me and my happiness and suffering, and usually that's together with the thought that my happiness and suffering is coming out there, then often that leads to a lot of fear and anxiety about the world because everything there is a potential threat to me. And of course that leads to loneliness because we build a big wall around ourselves to protect ourselves from this supposed danger. And on the flip side, we obsessed about me and my happiness. That often leads to a lot of craving and attachment to things. And that, of course, leads to frustration when we don't get them. Uh, and often dissatisfaction and disappointment when they don't really live up to our expectations. Uh, for me, the cognitive diffusion flag gets stripped up a bit when you, when you refer to selfish mind. Is there, are, are you, is there within that kind of an assumption that we have all these kinds of minds and one of them happens to be selfish and one is compassionate? Like, is that the implicit... Yeah, so here, I think in the meditation, I, I was trying to be careful in wording to avoid the cognitive fusion. And, and I was like saying, did that selfish mind cause this? It's not like, did you become jealous? Did you do this? Were you jealous? Were you aggression? Uh, were you arrogant? Because it's not, it's the selfish mind that causes that. Because if, 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 if you use that sort of language, people go, oh yes, I was really bad, wasn't I? Bad, bad, bad. No, that's cognitive I diffusion. Books, I had a, no, not really. Like, I think maybe you could untangle some of my behavior in, in a selfish way, but most of it was fairly innocent initially. And only, so I didn't, I, I struggled to really latch on to I, the idea of having a selfish mind. I found glimpses of it where I was right. a bit ignorant to what yeah, was going yeah. on. Yeah, so remember this mm -hmm. selfish mind comes in many levels. Um, and of course in a very strong level it really is I don't care about anyone else I'm the only one even to the point of not caring about friends or family that's like severe severe selfishness whereas most people are not like that and we have lower level of selfishness where where we, you know, uh, it's not so obvious, maybe. So that's why we really need to, to look closely at even the more subtle levels of selfishness because they're, they're, often, they're often the ones that sort of go below the radar that we don't notice, but they're actually causing us problems in our life. So if we don't pick those up, um, then this, they're going to keep sort of undermining us. So yes, it may be that we don't have this like, I you know I go out and harm people to get in my way. Maybe we don't have that level of selfishness, but there are more more subtle levels that are there. I think for pretty well all of us that are really eating away at us, and we really need to try and start to pick that up because it's you know the big things maybe are not happening all the time, but these little things are often very persistent. You know, like many times a day are we doing these things which are not outwardly so selfish, but they're actually sort of undermining us. So it's important to really try to, as much as possible, just even notice those. Because sometimes people feel like, oh, they're minor, that's okay. But it's not okay because the, often it's these minor things that are there all the time. And collect, then accumulatively, a lot of minor things <laughs> is, causes a lot of problem. I think I can do that provided that I look at it in, not as a totality, as I look at it but as uh, there's a compassionate mind within myself and then there's a selfish mind. And, and if I view it through that, then I have no problem yeah, with, yeah, yeah, yeah. getting there. But initially I was just like, my whole mind is not selfish. Why would no, I no, that's why I'm selfish? saying that 
That's right, because otherwise you end up cognitive fusion, and that doesn't. If then it's difficult. So if you exactly like that, you know, I have a little bit of a selfish attitude. I have compassion. I have this. I have this. We have all of these things. And if we view it like that, then I think it's easier. I think it's um, what makes it worse, it's the view that uh, there is not enough for everyone. Not enough for everyone. It's a view. Yeah, and that's the selfish view. Yes, it's <laughs> selfish. But I think this, the selfish mind becomes from this view, from Hamar uh, Merzot. Right, yeah. Grasping. Yeah, exactly. I'm grasping on this view. Right. But so there's not enough. Like yeah. All the jealousy, all the competition. There is not enough for. There is no shefa. There is no, right. It's it's a it's a view that makes us a selfish. Uh, but it, to a selfish. Exactly. Mind. Exactly. And that view is what we're going to look at in day nine. Is this? It's actually at the base level. It's just simply a grasping onto an independent me and an independent world. That is what leads to this and selfishness, exactly that view. And part of that view is the source of happiness is out there. And of course, we can never get enough of out there, no matter how much resources there are, because no matter how much of that we get, we're never going to be happy. And it's that view of that particular view that happiness is there, and we can never get enough of that. And so it gets, it's like, it gets worse, you know. The more we get, the more we feel we're, we're lacking. So the, to overcome this is to see, understand, there is, no, in fact, no independently independent world. Therefore, the source of happiness is not out there. It's here. It's so here. You give it. Exactly. So it's like, you know, and that's why with this view, often people uh, feel a lack of love. Like there's a big hole here. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to fill it from outside. But that's mm -hmm. impossible. Because it's that view that creates the hole. So, so it's just to So if you change the view, then there's no hole there. Because it's not about what we can get, it's what we give. It's to change the view that we are the source of the happiness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the source of happiness is within and the source of suffering is within. Yeah, exactly. Until we do that, we're stuck. We're stuck. There's gonna be a big hole here. Because that view creates the hole, that false view. And if we, the more we get into it, the bigger the hole gets. So of course then there's a complete lack of resources because you can have infinite resources and it still won't be enough. Still won't be enough. How can we explain it to our children? <laughs> In Buddhism it's used, it's what's called skillful means. Um, and to really lead by example, I think. Um, I know, it changed a little bit. Yeah. Can you please give some, uh, uh, you said, minor examples of selfishness? You said it is so common. Such as? Um, minor examples. Um, for example, here, going to the lunch, <coughs> looking and, and picking the best one of everything. <laughs> oh, that, 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 that... Uh, that carrot looks the best. I'll take that one. <laughs> oh, that, that, that potato is roasted very nicely. I'll take that one. Knowing, of course, everyone else is coming. I mean, if, it was, if the food was only for you, then it wouldn't matter. That's the sort of an example. No? Well, I have a question. Sure. So, uh, we are sharing bathrooms here, right? Right. So, I come to the bathroom and it is dirty. Right. And so I clean it. Great. So is this, this is not altruism. Is it selfishness or what is it? No, I mean, it, it, uh, again, it again, it's not so much the actions we do, it's our motivation. Mm -hmm. It's our motivation which can make it selfish or not. Uh, I'm wondering about 
about people that go through uh, trauma. Mm -hmm. I, I think that uh, people uh, that go through trauma uh, can uh, develop this sense of uh, selfishness, but then how can, uh, like it's almost impossible to ask uh, a person like that to... Yeah, so, yeah. So the question is about people in trauma often withdraw and become self-obsessed. Um, in a negative way, of course. And I think that to try and help people who have quite heavy psychological issues, um, often a lot of these uh, techniques and practices here are difficult to implement because these practices sort of assume generally a, a sort of a minimum level of mental health. To be able to do them uh, and if we're below that then it's hard to implement but fortunately I think particularly in the last five or ten years there has been a number of uh, therapies developed for different types of mental health issues particularly drawing on some Buddhist ideas like this and mindfulness and so forth which are directly targeting in an effective way those mental health issues to bring the person up to a, a better level of mental health so I think there's a there's a sort of a mm, there's a, a middle ground there uh, where I think there's a lot of good work being done in the last few years five or ten years uh, where there's been a sort of a coming together a little bit of psychology and some Buddhist ideas to help people to, you know, like, um, you know, if you have heavy depression, then one, I think one thing is this cognitive-based, uh, um, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy is, is a specific uh, packaging of mindfulness to really help people to come out of that. And so there are many other ones like this that have been developed and, and they're still being developed. I think it's fairly early days yet. But I think that's where we can help people if we have some sort of Buddhist background and we have some people we know who have quite strong mental health issues, it's good to find psychologists and therapists and so forth who, who deal in that area and draw on their understanding of how to apply some of these ideas in a very specific way to help people. Well, that's, uh, I think that like in capitalism, we really have a, like an engine of creating selfishness. There's <laughs> even a documentary series produced by this very that they checked like anthropologically that whether the market existed in ancient society. It turns out it never existed in any anthropological society. When they went hunting, if there was something to eat, they would always share. Sure. Yeah. Always. Yeah. Now in the same villages, like in the Amazon, they try to sell it, and then some people starve. Yeah. So yeah. my question is, if you have this engine that is in place and it's working, and producing lacks and, and uh, goods that people want to buy, and, and has these media outlets and this whole huge apparatus, how can you still resist it while you're living under this umbrella of persuasion? <laughs> Difficult. <laughs> um, again, it's really, it comes down to my happiness is there. As long as that, then capitalism will thrive. And, you know, we often hear, oh, we need to increase GDP. We need to churn out more stuff to keep the economy moving. But I mean, this is just, I mean, we're just destroying the planet. And we're just destroying the planet. And so as long as we have this view, we're stuck. Because this view is what's feeding this. Together with the selfishness and me, 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 I need more of that. So those two things together are a disaster for this planet. So we need to shift that. And I think... The fact that now we're at a point where that view is, is, is becoming more and more obvious that we're destroying the planet 
and destroying our mental health as well, and this is becoming more and more evident to more and more people, slowly people are changing their perspective. And as we saw yesterday, the tipping point, we don't need 75% of people thinking like that, we need 10%. If we get 10%, and I think we're quite close to that actually, people who are thinking like that, then I think there can be some pretty big changes in the world. But until then, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. So what would be a Buddhist healthy sense of self? Because the, the small example around food, does that mean we should take the worst food that we see when we go to lunch? I mean, I know that's a small example, but like what, or how, you know. Well, we should just money. take, food is just to nourish the body. So we just take what is enough to, to nourish the body. That's fine, that's it. It's not like we have to go in lunch go, where's the worst potato? Oh, I'm going to take that one. Because there is a joke about this. Because that can be also a little bit of the, the, the sort of, that can also be selfish. Like, look at how selfless I am. I took the worst potato. Is the goal then like, to, to shift into where that's not part of the equation? Or you're exactly. Not at it? It, it, I mean, the thing is, the healthy sense of, of self is, is coming through the emptiness, is through the interdependency. It, because now we're contracting around this as me. And as long as we're contracting here, me, we're stuck. If you can let go of that contraction and not identify this as me, what you'll find is that you'll see some sort of suffering arise and the natural response is compassion. Regardless of whether the, the suffering is arising there or here, same, same. Doesn't matter. And then it's not something you think about, it's just that's just a natural response. That's where we need to get to. And, and that's why I think uh, Buddhism has got a lot to offer because it's hard to get to this, this sort of thing as long as you have this sense there's a me here and a world there. As long as we have that, we're always going to feel like I'm more important. I mean, we can reduce it, but it'll still be there because we have a sense of separateness, you know. And as soon as, as long as that separateness, sense of false separateness is there, we're stuck. And the only way we're gonna get rid of that effectively is to see that there is no separation through the Vipassana practice of emptiness. Yes, but for general people that don't pre uh, practice uh, all this uh, kind of like my children or like everyone that I know, what is the first step that I can give, a simple first step to, to know that the happiness is inside them and not at the first step, it's a compassion. I think, well, I... No, I have not much expertise in this area, but I think one thing that can be very helpful is 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 really teach or get young children to be generous to other kids. Too late. <laughs> but no, I think I can that's see, it. I can because see the children because that all the time they know they're going around the world because they know in Australia it's better and here it's better and. I, and I just want to tell them it's inside you it's better, but then you know the trouble. But I think just even so, I mean, outside. but I think even maybe kids that have got a bit hardened, I think if you can just get them to do some a little bit of generosity, I think that can trigger things because they they can see that they get a lot of joy actually out of out of giving. But there are some kids that are being bullied. I think that the, the two, if they are empty of, of um, compassion to themselves, mm. I think this is the, it's, it's the first step because when they feel empty of themselves, sure. they're not a... Uh, um, and this... Shlemini, that's my yeah. And this, and this, I mean, this, this view, this me, me, me view, it's because I mean, there is nothing there. I mean, it's just epidemic now, and it's getting worse. I mean, with all this, you know, reality TV and that, it's an absolute disaster. And now, of course, a lot of these sort of 
famous people in reality TV are committing suicide. More and more because of this. Uh, the me, the me <clears throat> view, it's because there is nothing inside. No, there's, there's everything is inside. No, they, they don't believe in themselves. Exactly, they it's because, they're, because they're being they pumped don't. with the wrong, the wrong view in our society. That's the problem. I mean, all the... It's the self-judgment. I mean, all the, all the social media and all that, I mean, it's an absolute disaster for kids. What? I mean, it really is a nightmare. I mean, it's really I'm programming so them in a very, very bad way. Very bad way. I mean, really. I mean, there was like a, a study recently, and then we'll do a meditation actually. Uh, there was a study recently where I saw they, they uh, for teenagers, they measured screen time, you know, phones and tablets and stuff. They measured that against depression, anxiety, and low self esteem. And they found a direct correlation. The amount of screen time, the higher the screen time, the more anxiety, the lower self-esteem, and more depression. Direct correlation. And more suicidal thoughts. Direct correlation. And it's tragic. And you know what they are doing in those games? They are killing them. Yeah, of course. That's, yeah, exactly. In many ways. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. talking also on uh, 20 to 30. Yeah, yeah, Not yeah, only yeah, teenagers. Yeah. Yeah. Because the 20s and 30s have gone through that already. Okay. Um, let's do a Tonglen practice. Um, now, the Tonglen is, is basically the two halves of what we've done already, the loving kindness and the compassion practice. So I don't really need to explain anything. I'll just guide the meditation. Um, and we'll start with self and then move out from there. So we'll do a 20-minute um, session. Setting the body into a state of relaxation, stillness, and vigilance. Relaxing more deeply with each out breath.
and setting the mind in a state of ease and relaxation. Simply bringing it into the present moment. And simply becoming aware of the rhythm of the breath. Tong Len is a Tibetan word meaning giving and taking. It's a very powerful method to transform the selfish, self centered attitude into an attitude of cherishing others, to transform attachment and aversion into loving kindness and compassion. And we can use this practice. We can begin by using this practice to cultivate loving kindness and compassion for ourselves and then expanding out to others. And we can begin by imagining the inner purity of our mind, a level of our mind untouched by any of the mental afflictions, to imagine this inner purity in the form of a small white radiant sphere of light in the center of our chest at the level of our heart. And then arouse the thought, how wonderful it would be if I were free of suffering and its causes. May I be free of all suffering and its causes. May I be free of all mental affliction. So then imagining your mental afflictions and suffering in the form of black smoke filling the body. And then with each in-breath, imagine drawing that black smoke into the sphere of light at your heart, completely dissolving it there. <clears throat> so with each in-breath, breathing with compassion, dissolving and extinguishing your mental afflictions and suffering at your heart, dissolving it into the inner purity of your mind, your inner wisdom. And then imagine the black cloud is now completely extinguished and now you're free of all mental afflictions and suffering. And simply rest in that freedom, rest in that purity of mind. 